going to launch us off here um, with, uh, with, a question, with a question for everybody. Um, but you get your questions coming in, and, and I'll get them up here, okay? So I'll get the questions coming in. Now let me, uh, let me start with a quote uh, about purpose from, uh, from Richard Dawkins um, from his 1992 book, A River Out of Eden. Um, and he says this, before Darwin, even educated people who had abandoned the why question, the purpose question for rocks, streams, and eclipses, still implicitly accepted the legitimacy of the why question where living creatures were concerned. Now, only the scientifically illiterate do, but only conceals the unpalatable truth that we are still talking about an absolute majority of the world's population. So let me ask you, um, to, to, to start us off, does science teach us that there is no purpose for humanity? Uh, I might actually start in the middle, um, and, um, and then we'll, we'll see how, how it goes from there. Okay, Frank, what are you? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think science teaches us that at all. I think that um, uh, purpose, design, engineering are things that we desire as human beings. We would like to understand the world we live in. And so what science does is opens the door to what the universe is really like. And, and in that sense, uh, the questions of why the universe is the way that it is, why we are the way we are, those questions are very deeply within us all. And science uh, simply brings to the table knowledge that we can, we can assess as to whether it actually, there is purpose or whether we're just kidding ourselves. So, I don't agree with Dawkins. I think that, that the why questions don't go away. Mm. Okay. Because uh, that's part of being human. Sure. Uh, well, uh, if, if Dawkins thinks that only a scientifically illiterate person uh, would think that um, we should hold on to purpose questions, I would reply that only a philosophically illiterate person <laughs> would uh, think that science answers all the questions that are relevant to us as humans. Uh, science as the natural sciences, I'm assuming here, I mean, we were introduced as a panel of scientists, so I, I wouldn't consider myself a natural scientist as an ethicist. Um, uh, sci the natural sciences give us a range of um, uh, perspectives on the way the world is and our best guess at it, um, and often our best guess is very impressively good, um, but it's not exhaustive. Uh, and the idea that science, the natural sciences, exhaust all possible questions is called scientism. Um, and and uh, Professor Dawkins' uh, comment in that 1992 book is a classic example of scientism. Um, but that, uh, that idea um, is, is uh, not taken very seriously by most philosophers of science. Jane, Jane, anything to add to that particular one? Well, I think that's uh, you know th those are very um, very good uh, perspectives, and I and I agree uh, by and large to to, to those comments. Um, I yeah, I think uh, that, you know philosophy is is quite a different ball game to to science. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, it's hard to it's hard to use science to inform us of philosophy. Mm. All right, well then let me ask, let me follow up then with this question of why is it that we still believe in purpose? Why, why do we still believe it? Because we need to find a way through the world. Um, and so this is, oh, this is what ethics is about, is about what, what is it that we should do? What shall we do today? Um, and we all need to answer that question whether or not we uh, agree with Professor Dawkins that science gives us the only um, relevant details about the world or not. Um, that, that set of questions of how we are to live today is a, a set of questions that we're all trying to answer. Uh, and one of the ways of trying to get a handle on it is by asking, well, what are we here for? What is it that, um, wh what are the goods that are associated with us as humans and with the, the things that we interact with? But I think that question is really, um sort of one for each of us as individual members of society rather than necessarily as a society as a whole. Um, so I think it's very difficult to, uh, to impart a purpose to humanity as such because I think, you know, the purpose of, of an individual's existence, uh, you know, can be, can be very varied. 
So you're suggesting that humans have a purpose, but humanity does not. Would that be right? Um, I think humans uh, individually have have pur have their own purpose. As um, yeah, I think each of us has has our own purpose um, and our own goals in life. Yeah, but that won't necessarily be the same across the board. Let me take a slightly different angle. Um, everything that you see around you has been designed by somebody. Technology has come and brought everything. And human beings are purposeful beings. We are beings that uh, have a purpose and we make things and we design things and we do creative things. That's who we are as human beings. And so there's a natural flow on, in fact, into the area of the natural world that we live in. We ask ourselves similar questions the whole time. So, I mean, the idea that, uh, that purpose and so forth exists, whatever that may be for an individual, the reality is that it's just an extension of who we are as human beings. Uh, uh, we look at the natural world and we ask ourselves, that, rightly in my view, uh, why? Why does it have the form that it does, which is ontological, in fact, we discover it, we don't create it. And so those are the kind of why questions that persist. And throughout generations, people have um, attempted to write narratives and stories to understand the why of who, of who we are. But is that a legitimate move, do you think, to move from the observation that in a, a city, an urban environment, that everything around us has been created by a mind uh, with a purpose behind it, um, to applying that same assumption beyond places that have been shaped by human purposes. Why is that a legitimate extension? I'm almost tempted to say, why not? Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the reality is that um, uh, that why question continues to persist. And as we look at the universe that we live in, we see not only material reality, we also see non-material reality. And so there's information in our universe, for instance, that's non-material reality. The DNA is a code. And that code, in fact, is um, something which is non-material. Sure, there's a substrate beneath it, which are the, is the, are the bases that make up that DNA, but there's code. And there's non-material non reality in our universe, such as structure and function. And we see that around us as well. So this seems to me a perfectly reasonable, it may not be something that people, everybody wants to do, but I, I see it very reasonable that we just simply, that it rolls forward and that we ask real questions about the natural world and whether there is any purpose or not. Now, some people say, you know, some people come to conclusions like Richard Dawkins, who says, no, you're kidding yourself. Uh, and other people, other people like myself, would say, well, let's take a second look. If we're dealing with objects in the human world, if I can come back on yep. that answer, um, yep. and trying to work out what their purpose is, um, I'm going to steal an example that I actually heard from Lewis a week ago, and I thought was an interesting example, that uh, if, if, uh, if we come across a cake, um, and uh, we know someone's made it, and we ask, what's, what's the purpose of this cake? Um, then is it poss possible for us to determine what the purpose of that cake is without reference to the one who made the cake and what she had in mind? Yep. Um, and in the same way, if we're asking about the purpose of things that, that are outside the world made by humans, um, uh, is it possible just by looking at that world to work out purposes in it, or do we need to, uh, um, do we need to bring in talk of a creator? I think so, because the problem, you're quite right, you know, you, I look at a clock and I see that it has design and it, you know, that the parts put together. I mean, the gear wheels themselves don't define that clock. They are the substrate, they're necessary, but it's not sufficient. If you look at a whole range, the, the, I mean, you have gear wheels in, in all sorts of things. So the, the, there is something which we add. Now, I see something similar in the world, and yes, you, you, that only points in that direction. It's not conclusive. 
in that sense. So I, I would want to say, sure, this doesn't give you all the answers. But then, but then there are other possible sources of knowledge that belong to what's called epistemology that we might like to look at, you know, to see whether in fact there, uh, there's any other input into this to give us some answers. But you're right, I, I agree with you, I don't disagree. You know, you, you, uh, in and of itself, um, you can't work out those things without having some, some other extra input. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask another general sort of question of the gang here, um, <clears throat> and that is, uh, bef before I get into some, some sort of specific questions about science, the sciences themselves and different ways that they might shed light on purpose, um, uh, does, does the exercise of science, actually our, our, the very curiosity that drives us to do science, does that provide, show us some sort of commonality among humanity that gives us an idea of what we're, kind of what we're at least very good at or here for in terms of purpose? You, you work in um, brain sciences. And, yep. um, is there anything particular that uh, you can say about uh, our curiosity and how that, um, how that interacts with um, you know, kind of our, our functioning in the world and the, and the way our brains work? Yeah, well, I guess um, you know, we are certainly very naturally curious creatures. Mm. Um, you know, we, we all um, have a drive to understand the world around us and, um, and also a drive to understand ourselves uh, and, and how we respond to the world around us. Um, so, yeah, so I think there is, um, you know, certainly a huge uh, impact um, on that sort of that natural biological drive in humans to, um, yeah, to understand uh, and, you know, that, you know, really drives that knowledge, um, the thirst for knowledge. Um, yeah. And so does the, um, are, are we wired for, for this? And, and does, is, that, um, is that some kind of indicator of um, uh, how we've gotten where we, where we are as human beings, this, the, our curiosity? Is, are we, are, is our brains designed in a certain way that um, make curiosity important for humanity? Well, certainly, because um, you know, curiosity um, and understanding of our world um, has sort of driven our ability to survive mm. in, in our environment. And so um, it means that uh, you know, we're able to take in information about what's happening around us and process that information and then apply that information to future experiences. So, you know, for instance, if you um, you know, if you're out in the in the jungle and you encounter a, a ferocious tiger, um, and it takes a swipe at you, then you're going to be, you know, a little bit sort of wary uh, when you next go into that sort of area of the of the jungle again, um, because you know that that um, you know that you experienced something which was life threatening, um, and you're going to be avoiding that uh, in the future. So you know that sort of um, uh, you know learning. Um, sort of process has helped us to survive. Um, so yeah, so it's incredibly important and, and is actually fundamental in terms of the way that our brains are um, put together because we have um, you know, evolved these skills um, so well over mm -hmm. time. Um, and organisms that didn't have that skill Got eaten by the tiger. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though there's a way in which um, this this question seems to be somewhat conflating curiosity with science, and I'd like to I'd like to keep them distinct because I think science is a particular form that human curiosity takes. It's a, a disciplining of our curiosity in particular directions that enables us to do things that curiosity alone. Um, may not be so good at, and in fact that our um, evolved capacities of curiosity may. Um, miss and uh, it's interesting the example of the tiger that you know we were evolved to respond well to threats that are immediate and concrete and physical um, but actually makes us very poor at responding to threats that are, that are the opposite of all those that are non-immediate non-physical not easily observed um, that don't have a, a, a personality behind it um, even the personality of a tiger um, uh, and so the particular uh, issue that I spent a lot of time studying climate change actually almost could be perfectly designed to bypass a lot of our evolved threat detection mechanisms. Um, and it's only 
that we have science that we have noticed this problem in the first place, because it's not something that's available to the observation of a given individual just by consulting their own experience. It's only through a global network of observations over decades um, that are going together with quite complex uh, theories that have enabled us to recognize this threat. So there's a way in which the evolved capacity for curiosity, which had a, had a survival bonus to it, um, clearly, as, as uh, in, in our deep history, um, science is a, a cultural practice that has come in over the top of that um, to discipline it, and it actually um, has enabled a whole range of new things that curiosity alone was um, insufficient to, to reach, and that, that not all human cultures and histories and societies have conducted scientific inquiry, even if we've all been curious. Um, and so I think the question of uh, the, the practice of science doesn't necessarily reveal something intrinsic to humanity, um, though it, it, it does give us very powerful and interesting tools. Thanks. I'm gonna, we've got a question um, here that's kind of related to what <coughs> we've been talking about. Um, if, uh, even if the natural sciences can't define our purpose, can they inform us about purpose to some degree? Um, f for example, insights from evolutionary sociology. Um, and, and, I and I would add in there as well um, the possibility of, you know, again, um, what a healthy brain is good at doing. Um, does, that t does that help us um, figure out what we're made for? But it, what, what, um, to what degree uh, can science tell us something? If we've, if we've kind of all said that science isn't going isn't to do the job, what can it tell us? Uh, Frank, you want to jump in? What the world is like. You know, science is a, is a way, uh, sci science comes from Latin scientia, which means knowledge. And what's, what we do in science is to investigate how the world works. Um, and that's part of curiosity. It's not the only part of curiosity, I agree. But that's what we do. And so in that sense, it gives us answers to questions and then it raises other, other issues. And so in that sense, it may feed into the question of purpose for some people. But it, science itself is a, it's a pursuit of trying to understand how it all works, how, how, the, how, how things work together, how they're related to one another. Uh, a discovery of a universe which is amazing. There are properties in this universe which are just what I call ontological, which means that there's a kind of isness about the universe. Uh, such things as mathematical logic, such things as, as uh, a particular form that this universe has is not arbitrary. It's not just that anything or a thing can be done. I mean, when Stephen Hawking, uh, early on in the 70s, tried to construct the universe mathematically, which is a nice exercise, it's <laughs> lovely, um, what was discovered was that it isn't so easy. Now, you might think, well, it isn't easy because I can't do any mathematics, but there's actually more <laughs> to it than that. It's not so easy because the constants have certain values to achieve what, what we have. Now, there are all sorts of alternative theories that might explain that. But the reality is that's the universe that we live in, that it has a form. And that form is necessary, otherwise you and I wouldn't be sitting here discussing these things. What's amazing about the universe is that we're all molecules, we're all made up of you know, carbon, hydrogen particularly, oxygen, a little bit of phosphorus. There are a number of elements that make us up. What's amazing is that we as molecules are looking at the universe, which is also made of molecules, and what Paul Davies, who's a colleague of mine, said, what's amazing is that we're able to comprehend the universe. Surely, why? Why is it that these molecules can look out there and see other molecules and make sense of them? Anybody else want to want to <laughs> jump in? <laughs> we've got more to we've got more to keep going. Um, let me let, let me um, ask you something, Byron, um, and and I think. Others will have a comment as well, but it's particularly about climate change. Um, we, we, there's a, it's, a, it's a global sensation, um, as it were, and uh, whether you like it or you don't like it, um, everyone's talking about it, um, and people are reacting to it. W what, what is driving people's reactions to climate change? Is that, is that something, uh, w what common humanity are people you know, are, uh, um, appealing to, to, to 
uh, to try and persuade us to act or not to act or, or whatever? What, does that tell us yeah. something, our yeah. arguments about climate change? There's something really interesting about how people respond to climate science, uh, which is that it, it, uh, your level of scientific literacy isn't the primary predictor of whether or not you accept uh, the mainstream understanding of climate science. What's far more important uh, is your um, identity, uh, your, your sense of self, uh, and the, the degree to which you perceive climate change as a threat to that identity. Uh, because all of us engage in what psychologists call uh, um, identity protective cognition, um, which is where we filter new information um, in ways that serve to reinforce our existing identity. Uh, and there are many ways in which the threat of climate change is a threat to some of our fundamental cultural narratives of, of progress and the, the triumph of technology and um, uh, of consumption. Um, and we're, we're discovering that all these things have very serious dark side to them. And that's a threat for many people who may have invested their, their lives and their uh, political and personal identities in some of those narratives. Um, uh, and so it's, it is the kind of challenge that causes us to reflect not just on a whole range of really interesting, fascinating, complex scientific questions, uh, but also on some deeper ethical questions about who we are, what we're here for, um, and the narratives that we draw upon to uh, gain a sense of our lives. Um, and so certainly for me personally, um, uh, a narrative of a shared humanity is, um, uh, which is something I think I already believed in, but, but this uh, observation, series of observations that we've made, um, uh, really bring that home, that we do live on a single planet. This is something that's true of humanity, that we don't know of any other planet that has life at all, let alone other human life, uh, or any other planet that is even um, in the near ballpark of being able to sustain human life. Uh, and so the fragility of the planet, um, uh, which is our only home, forces us to ask questions that we haven't necessarily asked before about not just how do I get along with the people around me or how do I get along with my tribe or how do I get along with a whole nation of people, um, but how do we get along as a planetary community? Um, this is a, a, a newish challenge for us. One we already started to face with the nuclear threat, um, um, but that is brought home, I think, with particular uh, sharpness by the, the climate question. Uh, and, and so again, here, science has alerted us to a, a very interesting and important and relevant facet of the world that we would not have known about were it not for that series of discipline curiosity. But it can't by itself tell us what the best policy or personal response is. Um, and so uh, in terms of working out what our purpose is as humans on a planet, that we are affecting, um, the, the science of climate change is critical, I think, for us at this point. Uh, I think without it, we would be greatly impoverished and acting in the dark. Um, but by itself, it's not sufficient to determine, well, how then are we to respond? Thanks. Um, now, bringing it down from the global community to uh, at more interpersonal relationships, um, l let me ask uh, Jan. Uh, in particular, uh, in, about um, relationships and healthy brains. Are brains actually wired for relationships? Um, and how does a healthy versus unhealthy brain affect the way we <coughs> relate to people? Does that, does that tell us something about um, one of the aspects of our kind of fundamental nature as humans? Well, I think, I think it does. And, and I guess, um, you know, just sort of, you know, following on from the point uh, that Byron just made, um, you know, in terms of the globalisation, you know, um, you know, and people being able to conceptualise what it is to live in a, you know, and identify themselves as a community that's from a planet is actually a very hard concept for people to um, to grasp because um, throughout uh, our um, developmental history, um, we've we've worked on a very small scale. Um, so you know, when um, you know humans first, um, you know sort of started their communities, they were very, very small scale. Mm. Um, and, you know, what, what was happening over the hills was, you know, 
not relevant because there was no communication. There was no way of communicating to people that, that were, you know, across the mountain. Um, but now, because of technology, we're able to communicate on a global scale, um, which has is, which is really changed the ball game. Um, and, you know, cr um, facing something as big as, as climate change now, um, it is a massive threat, an absolutely, you know, monumental threat. But, um, but I think people don't quite know what to do with it, what to do about that threat because it's so big um, and requires such a huge um, response uh, in order to um, address it. So that's not actually answering your question. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> <It's> very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on the, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, going back onto the smaller scale of, of individual relationships. Um, yes, I think, you know, the, the, the way the brain is designed um, certainly does impact uh, a person's capacity to, um, to uh, develop and maintain relationships. Um, and you certainly see that in, um, in individuals with mental illness, um, uh, which is a subject of study for me, um, in terms of uh, people uh, are, um, have a tendency to be unable to um, sustain those interpersonal relationships um, because of what's going on in their brains, um, which makes it uh, which makes it very difficult to focus um, externally um, as opposed mm. to um, internally on the on the illness that they're that they're suffering from. Um, so yes, I mean the so the biology of the brain is very important um, because if if it goes wrong, um, then that certainly does impact our capacity to be able to um, to have those relationships and uh, and also I guess there's you know there's sort of a history of ostracization um, in terms of um, if you're um, mm. not able to respond to people in a way that's expected um, then you know there, there is a tendency to um, ostracize those individuals and so there's certainly a um, um, sort of a, a feedback um, loop there uh, in terms of, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Can, can I jump in and ask, yeah. do you think that, um, uh, I mean, we're talking about uh, different um, brain functionings um, uh, and some of those being um, uh, medically classified as mental illness. Mm. Um, does the classification of some brain states as mental illness rely on assumptions about uh, purposes for humanity. Um, that is, why, why would we regard certain forms of mental processes as a, as a kind of illness and others as health, um, unless we're drawing upon some narrative of uh, this is what uh, humans are for, this is what a human mm. that's working well <laughs> looks like. Um, I, don't, I don't think it, uh, it it's driven by an underlying purpose, um, but I do think it's driven by um, an underlying understand understanding of what constitutes normal behaviour and normal, um, uh, yeah, normal wellness. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, everybody's on a spectrum. There, there is, you know, and the, what's defined as being ill um, is typically when you reach a, a certain cutoff point, which is um, which has been defined by um, a bunch of people who have experience in that in that field and consider that once you get past this particular um, threshold, then you should be considered ill. Mm. Um, but uh, you know that's that's completely dependent on what the the normal distribution of um, of variation across the population okay. is. That's so what I was going to ask. Is that normal then set statistically? Is it a, um, an average normal or is it a normative normal? That is, if, if you had a population, for instance, uh, you know, depression, for instance, is, is mm. uh, on the rise apparently, um, uh, affecting many people, um, uh, you know, and, and I'm not at all meaning to undermine the difficulty of living with depression. It's something that I've lived with. Um, if we reached a point where more than 50% of the population was depressed, would that then be mental illness? Or would the normal would just be, have shifted? It would be normality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, it would just be a change in, perspective, in your perspective of what's normal and what's not. But um, 
but I guess you know the, um, the sort of mental illness uh, example. Um, there, you know, there are a lot of positive um, uh, aspects which are associated with mental illness as well. So, for instance, um, uh, you know, the sort of the, cre the amazing creativity um, that some people have the capacity to um, uh, to be involved with, um, who you know, in individuals who are you know beyond that cutoff point, the diagnostic cutoff point, but you know they, they you know they have um, you know sort of gain of function um, type of type of things and you know with uh, you know higher functioning autism you know we, where the you know the, the mathematical skills and the pattern recognition skills are just phenomenal. Um, so you know not all of the I mean not all of the things that are defined as illness or you know with a negative connotation are actually negative traits. Um, so, yeah. All right, now, we're, we're, let, let me ask a, um, a very non-quick but last sort of round of question here, okay? Um, and, and that is, uh, this is one from, from the audience. Um, how can the concept of God inform our sense of purpose? And um, do we process that scientifically or historically or how do we how do we understand that to relate to purpose? Um, uh, Frank, you want to kick us off? You, this will this will be your last um, last chance to say something. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of the things that um, that we've got to recognise is our sources of knowledge or epistemology, how we know we know, comes in various shapes and sizes. So it's not simply scientific knowledge that is how we know we know. Uh, there's intuition, um, there's experience, and there is, there is revelation. Historical information that we learn about at schools is a kind of revelation in the sense that we hear about what other people have done. We belong to a community, there's a cultural repository in which we teach and grow our children. And so the, the concept of knowing is much bigger. Mm. And so similarly with religious ideas like God, the existence of God, these also inform us and they are also part and parcel of the bigger questions of who am I as a human being. Jane, do you want to have, have a go? Um, I might need you to repeat the question. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> Just how does, the con how does the concept of God inform our sense of purpose in you know, 25 words or less? <laughs> <laughs> you got an easy question. <laughs> That's right. We, we, we'll let you go last if you want. Yeah. Okay. Thank Byron, you. We're, we're uh, 25 words. I'd, for me personally, less important than the concept of God um, would be the the person of Jesus and uh, seeing in him such an attractive picture of a flourishing human life um, that meets and breaks and exceeds expectations in surprising and delightful ways. Um, I think really. Uh, has been incredibly fruitful as I think about uh, purpose and, and why we're here. Uh, I think engaging with the narratives of Jesus uh, has been a um, yeah very significant factor for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess um, uh, you know I sort of see. Um, you know, the idea of God being something which, you know, certainly um, does give, uh, you know, a higher level of purpose. Um, and, yeah, I guess the, um, you, know, not, you know, people look for purpose in, um, in all sorts of different ways and in all sorts of different avenues in their, in their lives and in the, in, the, in the natural world around them. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and I and I think um, science certainly um, you know has a role to play uh, in in examining that you know that relationship. So yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I think we need to wrap it up. How about we thank um, the panelists here? <laughs>